All right. Well, so I guess basically just like I said before. Well, um, hold on. Oh, <laughs> my bad, yo. Let me introduce the scene. All right. So this is going to be the first session of. Oh, geez. All right. I had messages going off like crazy on me. All right. So this is the first session of the bleak dark or bleak white cold. Shit, cold. Bleak white dark. There we go. Very call up through the West sort of setting. All of you, for one reason or another, which I'll let you introduce in the beginning when you introduce your character, have decided to go to Antarctica. Uh, you're headed to what's called the Ross Station Research Center. It's kind of in the center of the continent itself, almost 400 miles inland. Um, over top of the mountain range, you kind of took down into a bit of a valley. So as far as why you're going there is completely up to you. You can decide that when you introduce your character. Um, you do have all of the passes and licenses to go to the station. They are expecting you. And while you're there, regardless of what you're doing for your own reasons of being there, whatnot, part of what you signed off on is that you will be helping the station take up basic um, research and maintenance and basically lending a hand to help out one way or another. Um, it's not just a total free ride here. So you're expected to kind of pull your own weight and help out. So all of you traveling from wherever it is you're from, eventually gathered up in Argentina. From there, you took a small plane, just a six-seater, that took you down to uh, Antarctica. You're on the coastline. It looks like an American naval base, although there looks to be some other. There's some Russian people there and some Spanish, sort of a conglomerate of different countries that have all gathered up on this small naval base. And you're expecting a helicopter to come through in about an hour, hour and a half, which will then take you the 400 miles inland to the Ross Station Research Center. So as all of you sit there, kind of gathering things up, getting all your things around, ready to uh, partake on your journey, you sit in front of a large, thick glass window. Outside, you can see that it's just pitch black darkness. Here on this continent, it has entered uh, almost four months of just darkness. The sun set for the final time a few days ago, and outside looks blisteringly cold. Through this thick pane glass window, you can feel the cold resonate through that uh, into the heated little small lounge room that you're in. It kind of cuts right into your bones a little bit, give yourself a little bit of a shiver. Uh, outside, you can see several stations have been set up. Uh, every now and then, a vehicle will pass through in the distance down a road. You can see a runway for the planes that come in and go, a few helicopter landing pads. And if you glance over at the wall, you can see the time is currently 10 a.m. You know it's a Sunday, and it is early in January. The temperature outside is minus 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And with that, Rush, why don't you introduce your character? So <clears throat> I'll be playing Mac Jones, um, <coughs> who's a big, big country guy mechanic uh loves uh four by fours and anything uh any kind of uh, off-roading vehicles things like that so heavy machinery any of that kind of stuff so kind of takes to it pretty naturally so he signed on with the expedition down here to be a equipment operator and driver um hoping to make enough money the gigs down here pay pretty well it's hoping to make enough money to be able to retire off into the country. Um, loves to cook. Loves to uh, have a good time. Like I say, he's kind of boisterous, but tends to be a pretty easygoing and e even-tempered even tempered guy. Um, probably in about his early to mid-30s. All right. So upon signing on to this and filling out your paperwork and putting your place within the station. Uh, you will be expected to help out with the maintenance crew and the mechanics out in the garages, work on the vehicles, either inside or out. Basic maintenance, the electricity and the plumbing, stuff like that. Basic 
repairman sort of person, you know that your boss, the person you need to report to, his name is Russell. Okay. Russell Van Pert, to be technical. But. Okay. Uh, Jesse. Why don't you introduce Marshall and why you're here? Sure thing. Yeah. Um, well, first off, looking around, you, you, you'll see Marshall. It's a middle-aged guy, but you can tell he definitely tries a little too hard. Hair's well done. You know, definitely goes tanning or something like that. Uh, has all the gear, the proper gear that he needs, but it's all brand new. You, you can tell it was just purchased. Um his bags are off to one side because he's still waiting for a porter to come move things for him. You know, I, I don't know what kind of airport this is, but there should be somebody handling this. He's paying more attention to his GoPro camera as he's filming himself. You know, all right, fans, I'm getting ready to head out to Antarctica, scout a potential location for next season. You know, hope everything goes well. See you soon. Oh, your gear, your suitcase, everything just sits there wherever it is you left it. You see people walk by it. Some of them kind of push it out of the way with their feet as it's in their way. Most of the people around here look like they're more naval officers and some Air Force, different um, ethnicities and countries. Give you a bit of a dirty look as you pass by. They'll notice the fresh GoPro camera has been taken out of its package. The well, plastic package still sitting next to your feet. And with that... Let's see, Liam, how about you introduce Gunner? What does he look like and why is he here? Camera pans over to an incredibly pale man, but with an incredibly bushy beard. Uh, he looks out the window, then realizes how high up he is and busts out his notebook and it's filled with pictures of different animals, primarily uh, Antarctican animals like penguins. There's a couple seals in there. And he stops on a page that says the check of red and underneath it's labeled endangered. And that's why Gunner's here. Gunner is a... A Swedish man, but I'm not going to be doing a Swedish accent because I can't. Uh, he's here basically to, he's an animal rights activist and he's looking to gather enough uh, eggs of the Czech of Red species of penguin so that he can take them back to Sweden or the London Zoo or wherever he's, wherever will take it so that they'll be able to thrive in captivity. Uh, and that's basically the main reason he's here. Um, of course, being from Sweden, he's used to the cold, but uh, probably not as cold as this. So he's brought along a nice big thick jacket. He's basically looked, to ignore the incredible heights that he's at, he's looking through his notebook and admiring the animals that he cherishes so deep, uh, so deeply. Nice. All of you sit for half hour, 45 minutes. An hour passes, hour and a half. You become a, you know, a little more bored, a little more tense. Outside, it's just darkness and snow. Looks like a lot of the other people around here started to clear out a little bit, going about their daily jobs, routines. And you're left in this small little kitchen lounge area, gathering things up and looking through your books and preparing. Uh, Mac, what do you do as you're just sitting there for an hour, almost stretching onto two hours? Look at the others. You see Gunner and Marshall there. Uh, who's the, the guy... What's the guy's name that's got the TV show? Uh, Marshall. Marshall. I kind of look over at Marshall and say, uh, just straight up conversation with him about the, probably spend most of the time talking about the TV show, say, you know, things like, so you're the, you're that guy that uh, runs that reality survival TV show, ain't you? Uh, you know it. Marshall King at your service. Uh, hey, do, do you know, is there anywhere to get cell phone reception or a computer with Twitter on it? Around here, yeah, no. you're in the wrong place for that, man. There's just no way in hell. Uh, of course, you know I figured somebody you guys would probably know that if what y'all was doing out there and all the wildness and whatnot was actually for real. Well, you know, we usually have a little bit more of a crew and some better technology with us most of the time. But uh, it's time for me to try my hand uh, solo, as it were. Well, ain't no technology going to get you no cell phone reception. <clears throat> you can just forget that. Uh, so be it. I can always record everything and get it posted up later. <laughs> so. You uh, you ever been out to Antarctica before? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I've been out here quite a few times. Antarctica, uh, Alaska, you name it. What can you tell me about uh, some, maybe some of the secrets out here? Yeah, any uh, any weird weird things going on? Uh, anything I should be looking for? Yeah, keep your coat on. That's the biggest secret right there. <laughs> keep your clothes on. Stay warm. Cause that cold will get you a quick, fast, and in a hurry. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll have to remember that. Yeah, man. <laughs> so. Just kind of, kind of prod him a little bit there. See if I can find out whether he's the real deal or not. <laughs> so you'll notice all of his stuff looks brand new, and his GoPro plastic is probably still in the garbage at this point. Nobody's come through to take it out. Sticks out a little bit. Uh, what do you do during all this time, Gunner? Uh, just pour over your books. Or... Wait, the, the the heights that we're at. I probably hear this conversation and I'm just sitting there like, stay warm, <laughs> obviously. Can't keep myself to myself. Both of you notice that Gunner just kind of flips through his notebooks. You see these pictures of these penguins, very bushy looking things. Uh, kind of have like this modeled sort of feathers on the stomach area and down around the legs. Flips through those a little bit. And another half hour passes, stretches on to almost three hours. Finally see a man come through the door. Very tall, powerfully built man, probably close to six and a half feet tall. Has a clean white shirt on, a pressed cap, pressed pants. You can see him as a naval officer of the US military. Comes in and Three of you going to Ross Station. Is that right? I, I thought so. We've been waiting a while. I, I think I might have forgot. Um, no, it's a harsh land out here. Well, you're going to be riding by a helicopter. It's going to be a cold ride, so bundle up your gear. Robin's here. She'll gather the lot of you in about 10 minutes. If you want to head on out to the landing strip, you should be on your way for six months of Antarctic weather. Ooh. So I'll just look at uh, Robin and kind of point over to where my bags are and give a smile and start heading off towards the helicopter. Yeah, just as, you know, he comes to the door, you see a small girl, probably in her upper 20s or so, barely even topping five feet. You see, she wears like a pilot's jacket on the back. It says Robin. She looks at you as you walk past. Looks at your gear, shrugs a little. Yeah, big enough fella. She looks over at you, Mac. Why don't you grab that man's shit and we can get on our way. And you, close up those books. You don't want to be losing any on the copter. Windows will be open. It's going to be a harsh ride, so cover your earmuffs and let's go. She kind of spins on her heel and heads out the door, following behind you, Mac. Or, I'm sorry, Marshall. Gunner puts his books away and heads off. Little, little briefcase thingy. So Mac will walk by the, the bags of gear and look at them for a moment and look for the smallest, lightest one and pick it up <laughs> and then start walking out toward the helicopter and just kind of give uh, give him a wink as it goes on by. If there's any bags, the gunner will pick them up. Doesn't want him losing anything. So yeah, you, Gunner, you pick up the last of Marshall stuff and whatever else you might have had there. Head on out. See this naval officer gives each of you a silent nod and wishes you good luck as he heads in and looks like he's getting ready to fix lunch or something. Close the door behind you and head on outside. As soon as you step outside into this cold, you can feel the wind whipping probably 55, 60 miles an hour just buffeting against you. Cold glows around you everywhere. Snow blows around you everywhere. And this cold just bites right through your jackets and your linings, blankets, your hats. Just kind of tears right down to your bones a little bit, almost taking your breath away for a moment. Robin looks over at you, Marshall, gives a bit of a snirk and smacks you on the back. Come on, hero. 
it ain't all just like film dandies out there. You'll learn a lot with us. It's got to be really cool. This is this is the most expensive code they sold. It's still going right through. Got to buy quality. Can't skimp on the clothing. Swings open the hatch of this helicopter. On the side of it, you can see it looks to be a fairly newer heli military-sized helicopter. It doesn't have weapons or anything, just a basic transportation one. But on the side of it, just spray-painted in regular red spray paint from a can, it says Kitty Hawk, and it has a little picture of a kitten on the front nose of this helicopter. One of the blades has been painted green, the other one's red. She lowers down the stairs and motions for all of you to hop in. Once everybody's kind of secured in there, she throws the hatch shut and climbs up into the front of this thing and starts things up. So uh, As soon as Gunner gets in the door, he chucks Marshall's stuff somewhere. He just kind of, as soon as he's in, it just, whoosh, and away it goes. Somewhere else uh, in the helicopter. Thank you. Once, uh, once I can feel my hands again, I'll, uh, I'll make sure to give you a tip. Gunner just looks at him. Sit down. <laughs> See, he's securely fastened. Robin looks over at you, Gunner, for a moment. I didn't think he was coming with a personal assistant. I'm gonna sit from the back and go. He ain't. <laughs> I wouldn't have carried his shit. Oh yeah, nicer fellow than I am. What's your name? Gunner. Gunner Espenson. Gunner. Sounds like a manly name. I like. To what about so. you? What about you, Hot Shot? She kind of glances over her shoulder. She hits a few buttons and things starts to lift off the ground a little bit. And glares at you, huh, Marshall? Just uh, seen you on TV, but don't know a lick of who you are. Uh, I'm Marshall King. I'm a survivalist, an adventurer, extraordinaire. Adventurous. And you come in a jacket like that? You must be a fucking idiot. <laughs> well... I had to buy new. I, the other stuff's locked up. Well, the, why don't you just come by my office when you get back to the station? I'll make sure you got something worth wearing. I don't need you well, dying on the way. So I'll throw her a couple blankets back there. You got it. You got it. No problem. You can feel this helicopter lift up. Your stomachs drop a little bit. It just starts to nose forward. The drop front end drops down a little bit and start to cruise through the air. It's quite loud, and she hands everybody a set of simple earmuffs. It has a little wire that wraps around for the headset. But hey, Morgan, before he puts his headset on, I'm gonna lean forward to him and say, "Don't worry about her, man. Weather around here ain't the only thing that's frigid." <laughs> Put my headset on. <laughs> Don't repeat that in the microphone, though. With that, she looks over at you, Mac. Sees you talking with it. And how about you? What's your name? Oh, m me? Uh, my name is Mac, ma'am. Mac Jones. Mac Jones. Huh? Yes, are you lumberjacks? That's what you remind me of. That's fine with me. All right. So, uh, what are y'all doing I've here? Been called worse. <clears throat> I'm sure you have. So we got a adventure extraordinaire. You guys part of his crew or something? No, ma'am. I'm a driver and heavy machine operator. Oh shit! shit yeah, she said. Uh, I heard Russell saying that I was supposed to pick you were gonna be part of his crew. Uh, yeah. Right. Taking place of uh, Tom. Well, not to you know mix things up a little bit, but you know Tom was the guy you replaced, and uh, things didn't work out quite as well for him. Uh, Actually got crushed under a backhoe, but that's not this to say. Forgot to lower the jacket properly. But anyway, uh, what about you, Gunner? I'm an Besides animal rights activist. Servant, an animal rights servant. Well, oh yeah, well, what kind of animals? It's the specific, well, most animals, but specifically the check of red, the species of endangered species of penguin. <laughs> yeah, I... There's a lady at the station, Allie. She, she's all about penguins and shit. I don't know. She just goes on for hours about them. You probably could hit it up with her. I don't know anything about it. Besides those red and black little fish birds that swim around and lay eggs. I don't know. 
But hey, if, if that's what floats your boat, besides you know being this man's personal bitch, then whatever you might like. <laughs> Gunner says nothing. It's quiet for probably a good 15, 20 minutes before she kind of speaks up again. It's going to be a bit of a long ride, fellas. Uh, you're looking probably about two hours while traveling almost 400 miles inland. She points up at the sky. Besides the pitch blackness and the snow around you and stuff, you do notice that the sky has this beautiful greenish tint to it. It slowly swirls into some pinks and blues and reds. This is uh, probably all heard about the Aurora Borealis, right? Well, this is the Aurora, Aurora Australis. You know, a bit more popular down here in the Antarctic, uh, on the opposite side of the world, if you will. This is a beautiful sight. We like to hang out at night and watch the lights glimmer in the sky. Uh, and have you ever seen anything like that before? Yes, sir. Really are. Oh, I figured uh, you, the adventure extraordinaire, would have saw that, not you. Well, I've been down here. Before. I've seen the Borealis before. I was on a, a Bigfoot hunt in Alaska when I seen that one. Did you find them? No, uh, no. Found some, found some tracks. Could have well, been, yeah. but ever yeah. elusive. You're just a shitty hunter. What about you? <laughs> Did you, you know, chop any trees up there in Alaska? Oh, Nobody. No, I don't. I know you didn't. You you weren't chopping shit, man, Marshall. In your big farm. Oh, oh, chopping tree? No, ma'am. No, I'm not an actual lumberjack. I just play one on TV. Oh, you're on TV too, huh? No, ma'am. <laughs> I'm also full of shit. Ah, what the hell did we so many people out to get for him? So I'm not good at what I do. That's why. Yeah, he says, well, we get to enjoy the sights of that, and off in the distance there, if you kind of look, you can see the uh, Transarctic Mountain Range, 2,200 miles of cold, bitter stone, rock, and nothingness. Some people like to think the mountains are beautiful, but they're desolate, they're cold, there's nothing there, so, you know, do with that what you will. So, Gunner's, Gunner's well, transfixed on this. This, the, the lights in the sky. Uh, who's on for a bit? Another now, half hour I'm, passes. I'm, uh, I'm recording everything on the GoPro during all this, and I, I'll turn to my. So, Robin, is there any? Uh, what about stories out here? Any any weird bumps in the night or special uh, special dangers or unexplained sights? As well. Pretty much nothing. It's just a desolate wasteland. Uh, you know, there's there's a few stories that go around the station. Uh, you know, the one that always kind of comes to mind. Uh, where we're headed, we're actually going to be passing over what's called the Smensky Station, an old Russian place uh, back from the. Well, they say, they say it's from World War Two, but uh, definitely during the Cold War it was active and whatnot. It's just a desolate uh, ruins now, but an interesting story that came from there. And she see she flips a few levers on this helicopter and kind of lets it kind of take it into autopilot. Keeps a hold of the handhelds and stuff, though, but leans back in a chair and gets a little bit more comfortable. This is uh, somewhere around the 1960s. The station had a bit of a hiccup. Uh, there was a man there. Ogle? Ogar? Bit of a loss for his names. I don't really understand these Russian names, but anyway, it's... Uh, they say that the loneliness out here gets to you. The darkness, the bitter cold, the emptiness, it, it can drive a man insane. You know, you know I've, I've seen it back at the station as well. You know, everybody gets a little bit on edge when nightfall hits. And four months of darkness is a bit brutal. People tend to go out of their mind a little bit. Now, we, we got medicines for that, and People get rest and relaxation. We keep things busy. We play a bit of basketball and floor hockey. And we got a gym and TV and everything. We were able to get the months to pass by without too too much of an issue. But back then, you know, the Russians are pretty strict people. They didn't have time for play and for 
you know, the novelty sort of things. But as the story goes, this, this man, Ogar, went a bit crazy out here. Ended up killing pretty much everybody at the station. They said before he did it, he just sat in his room for days, putting strange runes on the wall, hash marks, counting the days, counting the hours, counting the minutes as they ticked by. Said he always dreamed of how he was going to kill everybody to release them from this madness, free them so that they didn't have to deal with it. And, uh, you know, I haven't been to the station. Henry, if we get back to the station, you catch up with Henry. He, he's been there picking up some different supplies and, you know, scouring, scavenging the area for what it is. And he said he saw the room, the hash marks and the strange symbols and stuff. Gave his willy a bit of a shiver, but, you know, he doesn't like to talk about it too much after that. Might be just be a story, or who knows, those Russians are a bit weird. Maybe they just created something up to scare people away. But that's that's, that's about the weirdest story we heard around here. Besides that, there's a lot of howling in the night. It's hard to say if it's something out there or just the wind. The lights in the sky, some people mistake for UFOs and other such things, but you know, anybody with a science background or common sense know that clearly there's no aliens around. Obviously. And, uh, yeah, it's about it. Ain't seen a Yeti. I can't say I saw one of them running around here, so you have to mark that off your list for the time being. Yetis live in the Himalayas. <laughs> of course they do. I swear you're like a, his personal bitch. <laughs> uh, see, in here, I thought this was just going to be a man versus nature episode. I like it. If you go into that camp, maybe you can turn it into the Blair Witch Project. <laughs> Secrets of good camera work make any show. Yeah. He'll kind of lean over to you, Gunner, besides and pull her hair back or her muff or her headphone back a little bit in motion for you to do the same. Done. Yeah. She kind of. Jots her head back there towards Marsh, and you know he says, "Camera work makes any good show." From what I hear, it does the same thing in the bedroom it's between you and me. Puts her thing back on, and you can see she hits a couple more buttons. Everybody's throwing back into the seat a little bit as this helicopter picks up speed and just takes off. He says, "Well, I've had a bit enough of this uh, nonsense and chit chat. I need to get back to the station. I have some food, a hot bath, and a few games to play." With that, you can see she flips on the radio. You hear just good classic 70s rock blaring through some Zeppelin and Skinner and Journey and a playthrough blare across the audio. <laughs> and for the most part, she's pretty much quiet for the rest of the ride back through, unless you guys want to take up anything else or talk to her about anything. I don't know if I want to talk to her too much any or not. <laughs> What sort of games can you play in the middle of the Antarctic? Or was that a figure of speech? No, no, no. She turns down the radio. But she says, ah, got a very nice gym at the station. Uh, pretty common to play a few hoops. Uh, Bennett, the leader of the station, he, he, he's a big basketball fan. Likes to watch the games. All of them pre-recorded and sent over. Uh, you know, we've got a package in the back of all the games I've been playing on recently. So they're all replays, but... Down here, we don't get quite as much information or news as we would like to. Uh, he's a big basketball fan, and Gibbs, uh, he's the uh, special forces guy, basically the only military we have here at the station. Uh, it's pretty quiet for the most part, but just in case, you know, you've got to have somebody with a bit of weaponry experience, but he's big into hockey, loves the floor hockey. Uh, we don't have a nice skating rink, oddly enough, out here in the Arctic, but we do have a big gymnasium, rollerblades, and a few nets, so we like to play floor hockey quite a bit. Uh, Board games are a big, big pastime. You know, I'm a fan of checkers myself. Just those simple red and black discs. You can't beat it. Uh, Henry, he, he, I always play Henry a lot of the time. He brings some drinks back to the room, play a few games of checkers, watch some TV a bit. Big fan of Friends. It was a great show. Yeah, that's about it, really. You know, yeah, we do have you know play kickball from time to time. Plenty of board games and other things that line the shelves, but. 
I'm partial to checkers. Well, I got some good news because in one of those bags are DVDs of my first four seasons with King of the World. We'll add it to the collection up there, down here. Down here. That's just wonderful. I'm sure Catherine will be absolutely ecstatic that you brought hours worth of material to mock and make fun of. <laughs> I hear ice is just fantastic on DVD discs. <laughs> yep, yep. What was the name of the, the, the wifey who liked penguins? Allie. Allie. Oh, she's, a, she's a good lady. Don't really know what she's talking about half the time. Just a just a big penguin fanatic, I guess. You know, she, she's there for research on, oddly enough, to call penguins uh, like you are. She's been following a breeding program they have out on the Icelands. Probably would take you with her if you ask her one of these times. I don't know what she's talking about half the time, but... That's definitely on most of the things to do. Yeah, look up. She's a she's a nice girl. A bit young, bit naive, but uh, she, she's a nice girl. Just has to learn her ways in life. She flips on the radio, turns it back up, and in the distance you can see a few lights blinking down on the ground. She kind of points over, yelling above the music. She's on that station. She says. Uh, like I said, mostly just ruins now. They do keep some solar-powered lights going just in case of anything. But beyond that, just darkness, emptiness, and a room with a lot of hash marks, so they say. This is uh, about 15 minutes or so. We'll hit the station, and you guys can get into a bit of warmth. I can't imagine those lights stay on very long during these four months of darkness. No, it's, no this is probably be running out here in a few days. It's been, well, we're going on to the fifth day now of darkness, so... Probably not much longer, but that's what you get in darkness for four months. It gets a little cold. While we're flying to my ass, I say, well, you keep bringing up these ruins. Do they ever have teams come down and study them for anything? Or uh, I've thrown a, or flown a few groups down. It's, um, I imagine maybe back in the 80s, 90s they did. Uh, now there's really not much there. There's some drum barrels. Some odds and end bits of equipment uh, we've scrounged from time to time, but otherwise, just emptiness, you know. Uh, really, the only reason we got the drum barrels is because we were having a bit of a picnic outside and wanted some fires in the, in the drum barrels, you know, like the homeless people do in cities. We just thought it might be kind of funny or something, but roasted a few marshmallows, and that's about it. But, yeah, there's, there's really nothing there. I mean, people go there now from time to time and look at the ruins and whatnot, but beyond that. Hmm. And just kind of look out the, keep watching out the window, just well, looking at the sights. Why don't you give me a perception roll then? <clears throat> so I got a uh, two. <laughs> uh, you notice a few lights in a few buildings. That are, some of them collapsed, other ones kind of still staying in there, but they quickly kind of disappear in the distance. That's about it. Didn't really look like anything overly fascinating. You see the mountain range in the distance. That's about all you notice, because obviously you're not paying that much attention. So, Gunner Mac, sees the mountain range and shivers, and it's not from the cold. Mac, you suddenly kind of jerk. He's realized you must have dozed off at some point. You can hear the helicopter as the blaze start to slow down. The feet of this thing rest down. Lights outside glaring down onto this launch pad. Looks to be on top of a small building. Uh, out the window, you see four guys uh, look to be on like an ATV type vehicle. A big, huge snow tracks on either side driving towards the helicopter. Robin hits a few buttons, clicking this thing off, and looks up. Ah, shit. She smacks you on the shoulder, Mac. Wake up, wake up. So, this is your crew. This, these are going to be the guys you're working with, Mac. A few of them out there, you got. Russell, she points to the tallest one. See a taller guy, very dark skin, has sunglasses on, even though it's dark outside. Kind of swaggers with a bit of coolness as he steps off this thing. Uh, he's a, well, he's just a total prick, if you, if you get my drift. Yeah. 
if I was you, I really. He's wearing wouldn't. sunglasses and colors. That, that that was kind of all we needed. Exactly. Yeah, he's that's he's a total douche. Just I mean, just look at him. Hmm? You see this guy step down. He's fairly tall, a bit lanky. Pulls his hood off this big furry coat jacket that he has on. Still wearing his sunglasses. Motions for the other three guys to run. You see one heads over towards a building and disappears through the door. The other two come up to the helicopter though and open up the doors, help you guys out. Robin points to a smaller one. Uh, looks kind of weaselly looking, uh, either Latino or Mexican of ethnicity. That one there is Frankie. He's a good guy. And the other one points to a guy. Looks he walks with a bit of a limp, pale skinned. See, he's going bald on the top. Just has like the horseshoe type hair that he's like growing rather long, bit scraggly. And that one's Hugh. Uh, Hugh don't say much. Bit of a mute. Now and then he might squeak out a few words, but don't take it personal. He, he's a really nice guy. He just doesn't say much. And Frankie, hilarious little bastard. Has a lot of dirty jokes. Type guy you want to get, you know, at your sorority house when you have games. But, well, besides that, Russell's just an asshole. So take it for what it's worth. With that, door opens up. And you see Frankie standing there. He reaches up a hand to help Robin down, opens up the doors, and, you know, offers you guys a hand to help stepping down from the copter if you want. Hugh goes off in the distance working on some stuff and Russell swaggers up behind him finally taking his shades off and kind of propping him up on his heads a little bit. You see he has his eyebrows even though he has dark black hair it's curly and a black beard his eyebrows are dyed white. What do you guys do? I think I'll be a uh, I've got out of the helicopter and kind of set the camera up low and get back in the helicopter and try to get a dramatic stock footage of me you know <laughs> making landfall here in antarctica the other two see russell as he looks over at marshall one of his white eyebrows kind of perking up a bit smirk on his face shakes his head a little and looks over at robin then he sets his eyes on you mac Kind of glances you up and down a little bit, as if he's kind of measuring himself up to you. Walks over, holds out his hand for handshake. Russell, Russell McVendike, you must be Mac. Okay. Mac sticks his hands out, gives him a hearty handshake, said, yep, that's me. You must... Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, you, I was going to say you must be Russell, but you literally just introduced yourself as Russell. So. <laughs> yep, Russell. This is, uh, I'll be boss here at the station, so if I need anything done, I'll tell you what to do and you do it. Capiche? Right. Works for me, man. All right. Well, first thing we got over there, Hugh. He'll be, well, you consider him your right-hand man. He knows the station like the back of his hand. Yeah. He's okay at what he does. Fuck stuff up a lot, but if he does, then it's going to come back on you. You're going to be his boss, okay? Uh, all right. I'll if, get him straight. All right. And if things come getting fucked up, then I guess I'm coming to you, right? That's, and we don't need any of that, right? No, we don't. No. Gives you a smack on the shoulder. <sighs> and who's this guy? This bastard crouching around. See, he kind of comes over photo bombing your shot a little bit looking into your camera turn around put my hand out marshall king how you doing there just looks at your hand looks at you what the hell you doing uh, stock footage it's gotta look good why don't you just take a picture of me <laughs> We're going to be spending a few months together. I'm sure I'll get you on video at some point. And video. So, you, so you're a cameraman? you out here taking pictures of the emptiness, the darkness? Oh, no. I, I'm, a, I'm a TV host. Um, G TV Grand host. Channel, uh, King of the world. Marshall King. I don't know what the hell you're talking about, man. I actually brought some DVDs for your uh, library here. Uh, when you get some time, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure it's tough to get good television down here. So you just 
go around. The... So it, it doesn't Bear Grylls already do that? I mean, like, are you trying to be, are you like the next Bear Grylls? But it, Bear Grylls, is a, he's a hack. He's a hack. He, 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 he runs around just in the wild. I, I, I look for you know, I look you, for you know what I like about him? I love it when he pisses in the bags and drinks it. I can never get over that shit. I mean, he'll drink his own piss. I saw one episode. He was digging a hole in the desert, and he peed in that bad boy, put a piece of saran wrap over top of it, and collected the water. You ever done that? What, what does piss taste like anyway? I mean, I don't piss out here in the buckets and drink it, but, I mean, come on. It's, it's, you ain't no that, piss drinker, are you? That situation still escapes me. I have not tried that one yet. Apparently, ain't much of a survivalist then. Real survivalists will drink their piss. Uh, what, what about this guy over here? Walks over to you, Gunner. Looks at you for a moment, then holds out his hand to give you a handshake. Gunner takes it and just says, Gunner Espenson. See, he you know, clenches his jaw a little bit, and he just squeezes your hand as hard as he possibly can. Give me... Gunner squeezes back. Uh, He's not you don't? Oh, you do. Give me a brawn check, then. Actually, I need dice. That is a... That's a five. All right, well, actually, he got a five as well, so you're able to kind of compare handshakes with him a bit. Nah, it's, so what's your shtick? I'm an animal rights activist. I'm looking to preserve the check of Red Penguin. Ah, shit, I shot one of them the other day. Tasty little bastards. My face just drops. It was smiling a little bit, but it just drops, and I release his hand, and I walk right past him. And as I get to Marshall, I say, total prick, you guys are going to get along. It was I a joke, man. It was a joke. Man, kids these days can't take a joke. We see Frankie hurry over, turn some stuff off in the helicopter, and steps out, looks at all of you. And his eyes just absolutely bulge when he sees you, Marshall. He runs over, shaking your hand. Kind of grabs on both hands, just shaking it wildly. I seen you. I watched every episode. I have all four seasons. Is it true you're going to make a fifth season? Are you here for the fifth season? That's, uh, what I'm about scouting. your crew? Where's your crew? I'm scouting potential locations myself. If oh, uh, man. if we like if we like it here, then the whole crew will come back to do a uh, full episode. Um, right now, I'm kind of working on a. You can call it season four and a half. It'll it'll be just me out filming. A uh, little bit more of a. <sighs> intimate with my fans you know but I, i'm glad to meet a fan um you know i i, I got uh i got some autograph stuff with me i oh you know. this jaw just kind of drops a bit like, ah. you know i was back home when the first season came on and you know, i remember watching that with my kid she's just four years old and she was like man that guy's badass and i didn't even yell at her when she said it was badass because Dude, you're, you're totally badass. Uh, it's great to meet a fan. Freddy, wasn't it? Frankie, Frankie. Frankie, Frankie. Okay. Uh, it's great to meet a fan. So, Is it true that you got mauled by a bear during the third season? Episode seven, was it? You know, I mean, it ended a little rough and you looked a little banged up and, you know, all the rumors were saying it was a bear, but you never really released a statement. It was a bear. It, it, it was a bear. Um, I mean, we think it was dark. You know, we do hunt monsters sometimes, so. Maybe it was Bigfoot. I mean, you know. You never know. You never know. Oh, yeah. Well, we got to have a few drinks tonight. You have to tell me about some of these some of these things. Especially, the, you know, during the second season when you were down there in Guatemala and doing that shit. We're going to have to catch up. Uh, you see, he's getting ready to say something more. And behind him, Russell comes over and just swats him in the back. Then like, get back to work, you little bastard. So if he ain't got time to be messing around with this dipshit over here, running around in the cold, thinking he's some sort of video man and shit. Uh, Mac, why don't you help Frankie out, gather up the stuff. Got to meet Catherine back at the hall. So that he kind of turns around and just storms off through the door back outside. Frankie grabs up what he can. Hugh grabs his stuff. And they both kind of look over at you, Mac. Uh, I just kind of look back and forth and just be like, 
shrug my shoulders and walk over and start grabbing stuff. <coughs> Cranky looks at you a bit. So, uh, you take your Tom's place, right? You know. He... Yeah, that's that's what they say. So I think the woman on the on the chopper told me that uh, I was replacing a guy named Tom that had an unfortunate backhoe accident. Yeah, I was there for that man. It was it was grotesque. If you look right over there, you still see the stains of blood all over the cement floor. We can't get it out of there. Scrubbed at it a little bit, but yeah, he was working on the back coat and the hydraulics gave away that whole bucket loader, man. Just came right down and squashed him right into the floor. It was a pretty gory sight. You know, a bit of his brains was kind of splattered there. And, you gotta yeah. be careful of these things, man. If you don't keep an eye on them, they'll get you. Well, hopefully you don't die like he did, you know. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was, a, it was I'm sure it was a total accident though. And this stares at you for a few moments. Silence. So anyway, the name's Frankie. If you need anything, uh, fixing stuff and gathering stuff's my game. That guy over there, that's Hugh. See Hugh, kind of look in your direction, Mac. And gives you a bit of a nod. Smiles, but doesn't say anything. He picks off his hat and scratches his head a little bit and puts his hat back on. Grabs whatever kind of gear and other stuff that they got off the helicopter and heads out the door behind Russell. Don't take it personal, Frank says. Uh, no, he's just, he's just a quiet fellow. Doesn't say much. A bit of a mute, but he he is a nice guy, like Robin said. He looks over. You can see Robin's been leaning against the wall, her arms crossed, just watching all of this, shaking her head. Uh, well, I got to meet you guys back. Uh, taking you down to Catherine's office. Uh, Everybody ready? Yeah, I reckon so. Was he actually joking about shooting the penguin? Yeah, he said it was a joke. Out loud. Well, he said it out loud. Yeah, ask me. He probably did. Okay. I wouldn't put it past him, but I didn't see it. But oh. I'm not saying it didn't happen. Oh. Well, I may have reacted a little bit too harshly. I'll need to apologize. It's been a very long day. I wouldn't apologize to him. He's an asshole anyway. I, it won't I make a bit in. of a difference. I'll lean in. I didn't realize he was asking that in character. Um, I'll, I'll lean in and, and uh, say, uh, yeah, when you walked out, he, he said he was just he was just ribbing you and giving you a hard time. His yeah, I heard him, but I'm not sure if I believe him. His ass didn't shoot no damn penguin. I don't want to make any enemies here, so I'll be sure to... See him later on. Once I've had a sleep, I think. Well, suit yourself, Robin says. He's a bit of an asshole. You know, I wouldn't apologize if I was you, but hey, you're a better <laughs> man than me. She heads out the door, Hugh and Frankie behind her. You guys doing anything else or headed in? No, I'm going to walk I behind. Get, get out of I'm out. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting sight. <laughs> no, I'm going to fall in right behind Robin as she leads leads us down. So she walks out the doors, steps outside. You know, it's brisk cold, but just a few feet away is a small, uh, looks like a almost like an outhouse. When she opens the door, though, you see it's a pair of stairways. Leads down into the ground, into a tunnel. So it's much easier to travel underground, not quite as cold. This is just the underground hatch. She motions for everybody through, and you walk down eh, 15, 20 stairs down underneath in this large, it's about 10 by 10 hallway, just stone block. Still pretty damn cold, but not nearly as bad as it was outside. The far end, you can see lights on the ceiling all the way down through, and then another hatch that goes back up. Um, as you guys pass by, you see Russell leaning against the wall, and he's picking at his fingernails with a knife. Mac, come here. Come here. I have just a couple quick words with you. And which who was this again? Russell. Russell. Oh, yeah. All right. I'll go over there. Looks over at you, Marshall, as you look past. He's like, come on. Get out of here. I got a few words with Mac. And you don't, you're not one of the crew. Quit taking pictures. <laughs> Gonna have to watch that guy. What's the other is a little bit ahead. He kind of puts his arm around you, Mac. Opens up his vest. Pulls out this bottle of vodka. This is a lit vodka. Oh, God damn. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, so far everybody's been acting like kind of an asshole, but you and I might be able to be pretty good friends. So, hey, you know, I'm a good guy. I like to rib on people a bit. I'm sure you do too. You know. Oh, hell yeah. You call me a bully and, you know, that I'm a bit intimidating and whatnot, but, you know, 
my crew does the work. They do a good job. They get shit done. And I have to be hard on them now and then. But hey, when they don't listen, you gotta be hard, right? Yeah, of course. Of course, yeah. You know, I like to have a few drinks now. Bennett doesn't like the stuff here. I mean, yeah, you could be meeting Bennett a little bit later. He's a really nice guy. And I'll head of the station here. Gonna be a new dad. He's pretty excited. Yeah. And Catherine's his uh, right hand, the first assistant here at the station. That's what we we like to call her the ice queen. She's she's a bitch to be quite simple. But we me me and me and the ice queen don't get along too well. Well, if they knew I had this vodka here, you know, things might get a little awry and I might get in a bit of trouble. But you're not gonna say nothing, right? I mean, I'll be happy to share a few points with you. Oh no, I'm I'm, I'm just straight. All right. Well, you know, if there's any, any anything else you might need, you know, any other vices you might have, or cigarettes, and, you know, other things, you know, just you just let me know. I, I can hook you up. Uh, I got you. Yeah, hey, uh, won't you maybe stop by my office later this evening? You know, we'll mock that poor video camera bastard a bit, have a few drinks, and get you familiar with the place. I might like you, Mac. That sounds good to me. You do a good job, and maybe you can go places. I've heard good things. <laughs> Sounds good. Puts his uh, bottle back into his vest and kind of closes up his thing. He leans back. He's like, all right, well, I'll put you on your way. Then you don't want to make Catherine mad because you'll never hear the end of it. Most is on for you to catch up to the others and head on in. You can see once you guys get further a bit ahead, he turns around and heads back outside towards the helicopter pad. Um, Gunner, up by you, you can see Robin, Terrence, and Kind of gives you a bit of a glance. Looks back down the hall where Mac and Russell are talking. Says, Look, Russell's a bit of an asshole. Obviously, you can suggest that. You might want to tell your friend. Uh, he, he's probably not the best person to befriend here at the base. Russell's a bit of an outcast, a bit of a rebel. You know, Catherine, we're headed to her office, the right-hand lady here at the station. Her and, her and Russell don't get along. If you're friends with Russell, then you're not friends with her. And... You don't want to be on the bad side of Catherine. So I'm just saying, best bet is to avoid Russell at any cost. You know what I'm saying? Well, I don't really have much of a uh, choice in that since he's my boss. So uh, I don't mean to sound like an asshole, but I'm here to do a job and he's my boss. So, you know, she's just going to have to get over that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to be a dick or nothing, but I can't not talk to the guy. Just warning you. Just warning you. I mean, I appreciate it and all, but damn, she needs to lighten the hell up. Well, just giving you the warning. I appreciate you. We managed so she, to make all the friends we can get here. We're going to be here for how long are we actually here for? Well, as far as I know, That's six, out of character. six months. I'm sure that. Uh, okay. We're going to be here. For Go ahead. If we're going to be here for six months, then we better make all the friends we can get. She uh, looks over at you, Martian. So, six months on an excursion in the Antarctica. Did you realize you were signing up for that long there, cameraman? I mean, it seems like you'd have better places to go for six months for your show. Well, I, yeah, yeah, I didn't really read all the fine print. Well, you know... I've heard you have a bit of cash in the bank. You know, it must be a, being a, being quite the cable TV host and millionaire that you are. If, if you need a ride back to the airport for a few bits of pocket change, I'll, I'll be happy to give you a ride. Not everybody can handle it out here. I totally understand if you put pussy out. Gunner smiles, but he, you can't see it because he sort of holds his head down, but he smiles to himself. Yeah, I think I'll be just fine there. Thank you. I've handled some tough situations. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you have. What is it with this guy? Just kind of nudges you a little bit, Gunner and Snickers. All right, guys. She heads up the stairwell. She opens up the door. You can see it's just a basic foyer. A bunch of coats are hanging on the wall. Small little space heaters over in the corner. Uh, you can hear voices in the distance down the hallway echo here and there and kind of disperse a little bit. It says, well... Inside, you guys can hang up your stuff here. She hands each one of you a key. Uh, doesn't matter which one, but each one has a number on it marked with the locker. So there's a pile of stuff in there. Uh, just your basic stuff to go outside. Uh, these keys will open your locker, but they are also your keys to your room numbers. Remember them. 
your room has your bed, some uh, closet space, a couple of benches, uh, you know, some cases, chests to hold your stuff. So as far as the lockers go, I would just put whatever you might need before you head outside here, put the rest in your room. Um, that key only opens your room. Nobody else can get in there. It says there's a few people, you know, Bennett and Catherine, they got the master keys, obviously, just in case of anything. But, you know, we never have any problems here at the station. Everybody's pretty awesome. Besides Russell, he's an asshole. But he won't be going and stealing your shit, so you don't have to worry about that, at least. Is this Robin getting off the keys, right? Yes. What does my key number room? Uh, 14. I just, I just say to her, 14, don't forget it. I wink and then smile jokingly. <laughs> she smiles a bit. You can see a little bit of a pink flush in her cheeks as she turns. Well, I'm 13, so, you know, we can knock on each other's walls now and then. Talking Morse code. Pass notes in class. Yeah. <laughs> If you're real, real loud in the vent, everybody could hear us. But you know, if you just whisper back and forth, then we, we can hear each other. Not that we should do that. She looks around a bit awkwardly. And, well, anyway, Catherine, uh, she's probably waiting for a lot of you to get there. Her heads off, still smiling. Heads off. She opens up the doorway, and you see this large gymnasium on the other side of the doorway. A couple of people over sitting in the corner. Uh, looks like they're just looking over some paperwork and stuff. See a tall man, a shaved head, powerfully built, uh, real dark black skin. Looks almost African. The really, really dark skin, bouncing a basketball and shooting hoops for a minute. He looks over and you can see that he has a U.S. Special Ops Force vest on, or like a like a workout type shirt. He gives you a bit of a nod and wave. The others kind of look up and nod in your direction before looking back down at some paperwork they're doing. This Robin waves you forward. She watches over. Guy playing ball is Gibbs. Uh, pretty shitty basketball player, but he's a hell of a hockey player. She points over to the people on the stairs. The IT crew. You got Jin, Ava, and Haley. And she kind of points through them. You'll notice uh, the youngest one of them, Haley, looks like she's maybe 18, 19 years old. And real long red hair. A bright smile. She looks up. She quickly hops up and gives all of you a wave and runs over. Shake each of your hands. I've heard all about you guys coming to the station. I put your logistics into the computers. I'm going to need you to stop by my office later this evening so that I can scan your codes and give you name passes here for the station. Uh, what's your names again? She looks at you first, Mac. I look over and say, Mac Jones. Mac Jones got it. She writes something down, and you notice whatever she's writing, it looks to be in some sort of Asian dialect or Japanese or some sort of uh, different handwriting. She marks that down, looks up at you. Uh, Marshall, name? King. Marshall King. All right. Where's that zone? You see my face drop when there's no recognition. <laughs> yeah, there's absolutely none. She looks over at you, Gunner. Smiles. And what about you? Gunner Espenson. Hmm. She quickly writes that down. Looks at these and looks at you for a moment, Gunner. Looks at her list and looks at Mac. Looks at her list again. Over to you, Marshall. And you see her mark down. She puts a little star next to your name, Gunner. A little heart next to yours, Marshall. And what looks like a sad, smiley emoji type thing next to you, Mac. She says, all right, well, later this evening, after you get your rooms all set up and stuff, you know, put your stuff away in your locker. Stop by my office. I'll give you a few passcodes. I'll give you some keys. You guys will be all set up on the systems. I'm going to need you to log in each morning onto the system so we can keep track of hours and whatnot. But otherwise, you'll be all set to go. Got it? Good. Quickly hurries over and runs back over to where the others are and starts talking again. And you notice as you pass by and they're talking, it's still an I or a Asian accent or an Asian language of some sort. Robin just smiles. She's like, flighty girl, nice as can be, but nobody knows what the hell she's talking about anytime. So just just nod and smile and it makes her happy. She opens up the gym doors and you see this long hallway in front of you. It says Main hallway, everything that you would need is found in this hallway. Offices, medical bay, science labs, research facilities, uh, showers, baths, kitchens, lounge. All the way down at the far end is the rec room. But first, and she stops in front of a door and holds her hand up. And you see the nameplate on this door, written in gold, you know, kind of plastered, very fancy looking. Except for on the underneath of it, in like black permanent marker, you see Ice Queen, bitch, written. But the name itself on the plaque reads Catherine Michelson. 
She points to the marker. That was Russell's doing. Bit of him got into a few tiffs a few days ago. He thought that might be funny. She left it there as a moniker. She kind of takes it as a bit of pride. He raps on the door. And you just hear the voice come in or sound on the other side. Come in. She opens up the door for the three of them. She says, good luck. She turns and walks away. Looking over her shoulder, she gives you a bit of a wink. Uh, Gunner disappears. Looks like she's heading into like the kitchen area. The three of you walk into this room, see a woman sitting behind a desk, short cropped hair, and I like shoulder length, kind of like a bob. Uh, looks fairly well fit, like she's you know big into fitness or something like that. She wears a simple tank top, a pair of like yoga type pants. Uh, on the badge, she has uh, her name, Catherine Michelson, and there's a whole bunch of different like, military type badges hanging off of it. Uh, she reaches behind her and puts on a simple little coat over top. She says, you have to excuse my appearance. I recently just got back from the gym. And who are you? Uh, Marshall King. Um, You're that I, film guy, right? Yep, that's me. All right. Well, I've seen a bit of your show. I wasn't very impressed. Regardless, we have a few jobs for you here at the station. I expect you to keep up on your work, do your jobs, and if you want to go out playing the snow and take pictures, then that's your behalf. Work's done first, though. Understood? What exactly did we have in mind for jobs for me? <laughs> well, I was looking over your sheet. It doesn't look like you can really do much. I'm not really sure survival, taking pictures, and wrestling Sasquatch confers anything that was need to be done around here. But we figured you'd fit perfectly well in with the janitor crew. You'd be changing stations, cleaning <laughs> toilets, tables, probably help the chefs a bit in the evening. Think you can handle it, can't you? Gunner, Gunner, Gunner gives a little <laughs> with a smile on his face. I'm I sure I can find a way to make myself useful. Oh, I'm, I'm going to find the ways to make you useful. You just have to do your job, right? In fact, and she pulls out a drawer and brings it up, says, uh, Jen is beyond cooking your duty tonight. He'll probably need a bit of your help. Uh, just do whatever he needs. Uh, maybe chop a few vegetables, take out the garbage, wear your coat when you go outside. It's cold out there. Don't want you to shiver your dick off. Otherwise, hey, I'll leave a task on your door. It'll be there in the morning. Should be all right. What about you, Mac? I can recognize you from the profile. Uh, working for Russell, right? Yes, ma'am. All right. Well, smile and nod. Do what you told them. You'll get along great. Got it? All right. Sounds all right. All right. Also, not a bad cook either myself if uh, if you need some, if y'all need help in the kitchen and whatnot. Oh, great. Well, we tend to rotate chef duties around here. There's a few of us that like to cook, uh, you know, myself, and had a shift from night to night. So, yeah, I'll add you into the schedule. All you got to do is give me a basic list of what you need beforehand so we can get it in time. Take seven days for the food to arrive from the station but give me a list and seven days later you'll have your food and you're on dinner duty that night fair enough that sounds good okay. this is uh you probably heard russell and i don't get along very well the dude's a complete asshole uh if it was up to me you would have been fired a long ago i'm speaking young man you just wait for to speak we will well, I would like to fire Russell, to be honest, but him and Bennett have a thing, and, well, I got to do, you know, I'm not in charge of the station here for another four months, but given the four months, if you're still here after that and you make yourself well and do what you told Mac, you'll be happy to take his spot because he will be gone. You can let him know I said that. That's perfectly fine. And you must be Gunner out here to uh, play with the Penguins with Allie. You know Says, all right, and uh, what are you going to do for station duties around here? Got any other skills besides playing with penguins and, you know, filling up their eggs? I've heard that I'm incredibly intelligent. I could help with anything that would require that. I'm quite computer savvy and what have you. So, all right, well, IT crew is always in need of a bit of help. Uh, we do a lot with the satellites here. We don't get too much transmissions. Um, but, you know, I'll add you into their skill sets there. They'll probably put you to use. might only be simple, you know, printing out things and doing paperwork, but prove yourself, and I'm sure Jen will give you something to do. Uh, I'm pretty good guys. computers, too. She's talking. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Gunner. I like you. 
listen to this young man. I'm speaking. You need to be quiet when you're in the presence of elites. So, gee, not a few things down. Uh, Mac, dinner duty. Well, if you, like I said, give me a list, drop it off in the morning in a week, you're going to be on dinner duty. Other than that, you can help off in the office. Russell usually has a shit ton of stuff to do. He's a bit of a lackey and a lazy bastard. Uh, if anything comes up, I'll let you know. Uh, one of the big things is down in the maintenance area, back in the workroom, be room number eight. And she hands over each of you a map of the um, station, every room numbered and labeled. Says, uh, you probably know the station, you know, pretty easily in a couple of days or so, but she points off this room, shows the workspace, I believe it's room eight on the map. Says, uh, the hatch outside looks to be broken. He's been supposed to be fixing it now for about a week and he hasn't done his job. Another reason why I'm gonna fire his ass when my four, when the four months come up and you know, I take over the station. But if you get on that Mac, you fix that hatch, maybe, you know, today or tomorrow, well, probably not today because you got much to do. Maybe you can do that tomorrow, put it down for 11 a.m., fix the hatch in the workroom station. Then maybe we'll just get along. Um, while she's talking, I'm gonna I'm gonna have be like have my little I have a little notepad scratching out <clears throat> some an ingredients list already. So while she's talking, I'm just gonna kind of lean forward and put that on her desk. It's gonna have about twelve or thirteen things on it, and so uh, put it right out there in front of her. Man of action, I like that. She'll fold that up. Set it on the side of her desk. You see a pile of other things that are marked for the Schmelnock station, which she recognized is the one Robin pointed out. But it's, it's um, I don't know what they're called. They sit on the desk, like little plastic trays, and they put the different slots in that would be sent out to different areas. Yeah, but this one is labeled as a Schmelnock station, but she sets it there with a bunch of other stuff anyway. Says, I will send all that stuff out probably tomorrow morning then. And yeah, in a week, you will be on dinner duty. Otherwise, just, you know, if let the people know in the kitchen that you're willing to help out and how consider they that your your work for the bits. Do your jobs and otherwise the rest of the time it's up to you to you know cover whatever Russell needs and relaxation. And Gunner, you're gonna be helping Ellie. She has requested a bit of your assistance in playing with the penguins. I don't know what she needs. Don't really care. I'm not the penguin lady. So helping her out and otherwise helping the IT crew out. Easy enough. And Mac, you're gonna be on janitor duty. Um, tomorrow morning, the toilets will need to be cleaned. The garbages will be taken out of each room. Um, as long as you get those done, make sure the toilets are quite clean. I do check them after each morning. I do not want to see a turd in the toilet. Um, besides that, you, you will be good to go play in the snow. You want me to fix the hatch and do the janitor duty? Oh, she looks on Mac and Marshall. I'm going to get your names confused. I'm not very good <laughs> with names. Marshall. You will be on janitor duty in the morning, cleaning the toilet, taking out the garbage. Like I said, wear a coat. No turds in the toilet. I will check. And then you can go play in the snow with your camera and wrestle Sasquatches or whatever it is you do outside. I'm going to pat Marshall while she gives him reach over and pat him on the shoulder. So, any questions, gentlemen? You got six months here with me. I'm sure if you work hard, do as you're told, we'll get along perfectly fine. Oh, she reaches over, pulls out three books. You can see these things are like 500-page thick booklets, slaps one down in front of each of you. The rules, regulations, and uh, procedures here at the station, you need to make sure you read through these. Um, I will be asking questions about them whenever I see you in the halls. Probably at least a chapter a day. It should take you uh, probably four weeks or so to get through this whole thing. But you do need to know it if you plan to be here for any longer than that. Anything else? Marshall, you look a little confused. You can't read, right? <laughs> I mean, you don't just play in the snow and take pictures. Yes, ma'am. I can read. All right. Great. Any other questions? Nothing? Nobody? I think we're good. So you speak for all of these men? No, I mean, I think you know, it's, a, it's an expression, a Southern expression. Uh, I'm good. Well, I'm not from the South, so I wouldn't know that. That's okay. We'll teach you. I don't need any of that. I'm plenty good enough. So... <laughs> If a lot of you would like to go ahead, and, well, you know, I don't have any work for the day. I'll at least give you a few hours off. Uh, explore the station, have a bit of fun, meet some people. Uh, you know, every night we head on up to the uh, observatory, watch the lights, hang out, have a few drinks. It's usually pretty quiet when I'm up there for whatever reason. People don't quite talk as much and they go to bed early. But, you know, I might swing up tonight to hang out and meet a lot of you, learn a little bit more. I'm quite interested in... And she looks at you, Marshall. 
no, actually, I'm not interested at all in what you do, but perhaps I will listen to your endeavorings if you would so like. If I drink enough, then you know, I'm happy to talk a little bit about it. She says, send, let me be excused. With that, she just looks down, takes out some paperwork, and starts working on it. I just kind of slap my knees and stand up and start heading out the door. I will begrudgingly leave as well. <laughs> Gonna leave smelling under his under his face. Can I get a clarification point, Morgan? Yes, sir. When Robin said she was thirteen, did she mean her room number was thirteen? Yes. Okay, good, because I think both me and Rush misinterpreted that. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> no, she's probably. I was like, oh. Well, she, was oh. The, she was flying the helicopter. I assume she was. <laughs> I got really confused. I'm like, oh shit. Eagle. <laughs> so that's what that's why I made the, the quip about passing notes in class. <laughs> okay, okay, we're good. Got her, got her. He's like, I don't feel creepy anymore. He's like, oh, that's what she meant. <clears throat> She's probably in her upper 20s, like 27, 28, somewhere in that kind of frame. <laughs> when you step back under the hall, you're kind of left sitting there. You can see a few people moving around here in the hall, moving between different rooms and doing some stuff. You can hear some noise in the gymnasium going on and you can hear, as you step out, Gunner, and look around inside, you can hear Catherine. Shut the door, Gunner. We don't live in a barn. Gunner shuts the door. I think I liked Russell better. <laughs> I think we're all going to have to learn to get along. I mean, you know. Do you think we have TVs in our rooms with DVD players? Oh, well, certainly. I have, to, I have to admit, King, I also have never seen your show, but maybe I can get into it. Well, now we're talking. Uh, I'll make sure you get first run at the, uh, the sets I brought with me. <clears throat> now I think I'm going to make a start on this book, and he holds up the big rules and regulation thing. Don't want to be stepping on any toes. Oh, Kind of look down at the book and just be like, shit. <laughs> I think that's about the time that I'll realize I'll turn around and knock back on uh, Catherine's door. Uh, I, I forgot my book. Sorry. <laughs> she just you know, kind of glares up out of the corner of her eyes and gives a bit of a nod. Of course it would be you. Don't worry, Mac. I'll, don't worry, Mac. I'll see if I can find one of the pictures. <laughs> but he smiles warmly, so you know he's joking. That's all right. I was going to say, he could have mine if he wants. What's she going to do? Throw me off? I, I don't really want to know. <laughs> it's very cold out there, Mac. Oh, There's the three of you are in this hallway looking at your books. and Marshall comes out with his, shutting the door behind him before he gets yelled at. You see a man coming down the hallway, a bit heavier set, a bit of a belly on him. Looks like he's in his 40s. Um, you can see he wears just a simple pair of slacks, uh, leather shirt, or a um, plaid type shirt with a leather overcoat type thing. In his hands, he's reading How to Be a Father for Dummies, and his nose is in this book as he's walking, not clearly paying attention. And he literally just slams right into you, Mac, bumping into you. He quickly looks up. He's probably only like five, six, five, seven, not a real big man. And he, his eyes wide, he's like, oh, I am sorry there, fellow. Ah, the new recruits. And he holds out his hand. Bennett, I'm the station leader here at the office. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit preoccupied lately. I'm getting ready to retire. I've got a child on the way. I'm going to head back on home to Texas and soon, uh, enjoy retirement. Yeah, I heard you had a little one coming. Congratulations. Ah, thanks, man. It's, uh, you have any kids? No, not yet. And he looks over at... You gunner, you got any kids? Oh no, goodness, no. <laughs> you got any kids? He looks at you, Marshall. Uh, according to the alimony and child support payments, yes, I do. Oh, <laughs> probably not the guy I want to talk to about parenting. Then, <laughs> oh, this is book. I really want to say none that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> he says, "Well, yes, sir, you know." Getting retired here in a few months. Uh, happy to be able to meet all of your acquaintances and 
at least to spend a good four months with you, learn about your pist your histories. And, well, you know, if you need anything here at the station, I'll be happy to oblige. He looks up, noticing that you're outside Catherine's room. He's like, <coughs> she's a bit rough. I, I know, she says, and I'm sure she gave you these books. She will be testing you on them. You know, I heard all about how she's the ice queen, and she's a bitch. She says, I completely understand if you don't like her. However, she's good at what she does, and to be quite honest, the station wouldn't run without her. So keep your nose down and your head clear, and you'll be all right. Thank you, Bennett. So, no, if you need anything, just let me know. Um, most of the work has been kind of piled over to her. She gets ready to take over the station. He says, uh, well, to be quite honest, I don't really do a whole lot around here anymore. I help out as needed and you know, break down the rules as needed, he says, but uh, I'm pretty much getting ready to retire. With that, he gives off a nice warm smile. He says, uh, floor hockey tonight, 8 p.m. If any of you guys are interested, he says, I'd love to score a few goals on you. He kind of gives you a nod, that sort of thing with his hands, and turns around, putting his nose back into the book. Oh, Gunner. Can I help it? It might be unusual for me to swap from skating to standing and hitting a puck. Oh, Thanks, Miles. Well. well, we have rollerblades, if you would like to use them. I would have break a hip if I was to do that. I'm a bit old now, so I, I just run around in my sneakers. But hey, if you want to be the show boy and use rollerblades, then you should right. can. There's not many uh, sports in Sweden, so I had to take up ice hockey. So I've been a while since I've played, so maybe I'll give the floor one a go. Oh, no, that's a challenge accepted. Gives you a bit of a wink and turns back around once again, opening up his book and just his nose buried into this book on how to be a parent or how to be a father for dummies. And continues on down, turning around a corner. And once again, the three of you are sort of left there in this hallway. You can hear people around and stuff, but... Nobody like in the hallway itself. So. We're in the main hall. Yes. Um. So you said that hatch that was broken was in over in room. Uh. You said it was room eight or was it the maintenance room seven? Mm, maintenance room seven. I don't have my map up on me, but yep, number That's seven. Okay. Um. Well, I'm probably gonna go ahead and um. We've already dropped. Have we dropped our stuff off in our? We've already dropped our stuff off in our rooms, right? If you wanted to. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'm actually going to take a moment to, to go inspect the... I'm assuming the broken hatch she, they're talking about is the, the one the outs, the one that goes to the outside door. Yes. So, so yeah, as you box. come in, you can see it's a basic... It's not a full-size door on the wall, um, but it's more like one of those half doors, metal paneling over top of it. You can see that it's hanging off a bit crooked. Um, if you open up the main hatch to pull the plate off and stuff, it looks like it's... um. Almost like a duct or a ventilation vent. It's about four foot square in size, and it leads down in, and then kind of takes a turn. But you can see the door itself is just uh, completely hanging off on its hinges. Okay, so I was just going to kind of eyeball it over and see what it is that I will need to do to be able to fix it. Look through it. it looks like something heavy must have smashed into it. It's dented up a bit. You can see one of the hinges is broken. Probably going to need to be welded back together, and then or maybe a whole new hinge is replaced or something. Um, you can see that on the front of it, it had what looked to be, um, I don't know what they're called, but sort of like the circular things you would grab a hold of and crank open to unrelease the lock and pull it open. Um, that's been banged up in the locking mechanism itself. The deadbolt is still sticking out. And, you know, try to turn that or whatever. It doesn't budge at all. Um, maybe the gears inside are guided up or something. Okay. All right. Probably something that's going to need a whole complete replacement. All right. I was just going to see if it's something that could be fixed quickly. I might try and knock it out that evening. Or looking it over, you can see probably one of the reasons it hasn't been done is it's actually, you know, making a whole new door. It looks like, as far as trying to fix it the way it is, probably not. If you want to try, you can give me a roll. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so what would this fall under? Um, what were your stats again? Well, unfortunately, my intellect is at a minus two. That's what I thought. Being this kind of fits your your niche or whatever, why don't you give it a plus two in this case? Right. So, oh, shit, I went out of the thing. Oh, get out there. Uh, this time I got a um, seven. So, yeah, looking over it, um, you can see when you take the panel off and everything, the deadbolt itself is stuck out. Whatever smashed into the front of this thing pretty much kind of bent the door in. 
uh, caving in some of the gears and the locking mechanisms inside. As far as you can tell, this whole door would have to be replaced, either you know, completely cut out and molded or you know, uh, fabricated, or unless maybe they have a, one already in storage or something. But yeah, this whole thing needs to be replaced. All right, we'll look into it tomorrow. But the door is on the inside of the room, correct? Yes. So whatever hit it, hit it from the inside. Correct. Okay. Yep. It right. looks like it must have been something heavy. I mean, it's a pretty standard-sized uh, steel door, hatch door. Um, but, yeah, whatever it hit, it must have been heavily or moving very heavily quick. That's, that's cool. So as he's How in there... books could I knock out? <laughs> I'm gonna say, as he's in there with that, Gunnar, you're reading your book. Why don't you give me an intellect roll? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, it's a five. Five. Well, in that case, we'll just say 50%. Oh, nice. It's so like four weeks, and I'm like, I've knocked out 50 pounds of this thing. So you spend the rest of the evening basically just pouring through the book? Yep. Or afternoon, anyway. If, if anyone needs me, they can, they can drop on by room 14, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm reading the book. Nice. All right. And Marshall, as you see, going to go off to read his book, and Max heads off to the maintenance room, leaving you alone in this hallway, drop off your stuff in your room. What do you do? So uh, I'm actually going to go over because, you know, they gave me a map and I was looking around. I see there's, you know, there's an IT lab and a communications room. And I really want to get a message out to my personal assistant, Valerie, <laughs> who filled out all the paperwork for this for me and, and didn't tell me half of the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a real simple message. It can be an email or you know a satellite phone. Uh, Valerie, you you will never work with me again. You're fired. You set me up. Oh, my email. You're fired. So as you know, the IT lab, you can see a man sitting there. I uh, notice it's uh, Jen. It's the same girl or same guy that Robin pointed out when he came in and. He recognizes a little name tag. Probably the guy you're going to be helping cook later this evening. He looks up. Could you? Uh, yes, sir. What, what, what can I help you with? I I, I, just, I need to get a, a, a communication out, an email is fine. Mm -hmm. I just, um, we we can do that. Uh, you just got to punch in your passcode numbers here to log into the system. And he pulls over a chair. He said, uh, did you get your passcodes from Haley yet? Uh, not yet. That's That's... Still pending. Um, it's not a private email. Uh, it, you know, if you could send it, uh, you know, uh, uh, here's my personal assistant's email address. Um, if I don't have a passcode yet, yeah, th this communication is <sighs> very important. It needs to go out as soon as possible. Well, you know, the thing is, you know, one person can't use another person's account. It's it's right there, page 243 in your guidebook of rules here and regulations. So, uh, <laughs> if you to log into my my account and send an email, well, that's rules for disciplinary action and write-ups. Wow. And, you know, we really can't be doing that. Um, if you just wow. speak with Haley, then she'll probably be able to get you a passcode and get you set up. And, you know, it only takes about an hour to get you set up on the system. So if you want to talk with her, get a few numbers, come back, let me know. Then, you know, I'll set you up on the system and you can send out an email because I can't be breaking any rules. I see. But now, counterpoint, I'm not actually asking to log into your account. I'm just asking you to send the email for me. I don't even need to touch the computer. I can just tell you type. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you what. Have you ever seen the show King of the World? <laughs> Is it like a Elvis reality program? <laughs> Is Elvis hunting Bigfoot? Says, I don't think I have, but you know, it's, it sounds certainly interesting. You know, I do like Elvis. What's, what's it about? It's not actually about Elvis. Um, it's about me, um, Marshall King. Uh, I I look for lost treasures. Uh, I hunt monsters. Oh, you're talking about my thing. What kind of treasures you found? 
Oh, I mean, I did find possible evidence of location of what could have been Atlantis. Uh, we do have some grainy footage of what could have been the Louisiana Swamp Monster. Um, one or two possible footprints from a Bigfoot or a Yeti. Uh, we got some really cool EVPs from from possible ghost. Oh, no, that's that's made my style. This is, uh, so did you bring you know the EVP equipment with you or EVP? No, um, I did come up here more of a man versus nature. So I wasn't really expecting ghost, but I mean, back to the, the matter at hand, why don't I give you a signed copy of season one and you can just send that email out for me real quick. Well, I don't really watch much TV. I'm much more of a vine person, just, you know, eight second snippets. But I've been having a bit of a problem. Maybe you can help me out with that, and maybe you scratch my back, and I'll scratch yours. It's um, been a bit of a weird things happening in my room lately. I put my toothpaste always on the left-hand side of the sink, and when I wake up, it's on the right. And I find that a little strange. And Sometimes I hear footsteps in my room at night. Always at 2.13 a.m. Sounds like it's uh, stepping, walking around my bathroom and out by my bed. And, well, I think my room might be haunted. So maybe you can come stay in my room one night and maybe I can send it to else. Maybe we can figure something out. Did you say it was Haley that I go to for the passcodes? <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Speak with Haley. You can get the passcode. She'll set you up on the system. Uh, it takes about an hour. But really, I, you know, I've been a bit paranoid about this. I thought it was just me. Nobody else believes in ghosts around here. But you know, now that we have a ghost expert here at the station, I'm a little bit more of a cryptid guy. Uh, you know, cryptozoology. Um, well, we did never, you know, throw out that it might. It very well could be a Sasquatch or a Yeti or whatever the. Antarctic counterpart is. Was this I mean, a woman sitting at the table or the thing or a guy? A guy. <laughs> Jen, J I N. He says, but you know, mate, I'm just maybe set up. I, I see you got your GoPro 4012 there and a latest model. We could set that up. It has night vision on it. Maybe, maybe we can figure out what's going on. You know, I really don't like having my toothpaste move. And, can you just imagine if the ghost is licking the toothpaste and then I'm getting like ectoplasm in my mouth in the morning and I'll tell you what. Let's put a pin in that. You are absolutely right. It is my first day. I should not be breaking rules. I should go get my passcodes from Ali. But I will note this down. And I mean, right now it's just toothpaste. We can definitely consider taking a look at and then I just walk out. <laughs> Right in the middle of the sentence. Two thirteen a.m. That's when it happens. Room four. Four. Just... As he says that, I look. Uh, I look at my key. What room am I in? Of course, you're number three. Of course. <laughs> and you see, he kind of peeks his head around the corner. Roomies. Yeah, as soon as I get out of the room, if nobody's looking, I'm definitely taking a value. <laughs> it's better than drinking Bear Girls piss. <laughs> so, as you know, you have your thing, and everybody's doing those things. A few hours pass, it gets to be about 7 p.m. You can hear the loudspeakers kick on over the station. Uh, sounds like a man's voice. Nobody you immediately recognize or anything. Uh, announcing that dinner is served in the kitchen. Um, at 8 o'clock, there will be a roller rink and a ice, well, ice hockey or floor hockey, whatever you want to call it, um, 
game. If anybody would like to attend, sign-up sheets are on the wall. And with that, Chicken Fricassee is served for the evening. Let's see here, it clicks off. People start kind of exiting out of their bedroom rooms there in the medical bay and other things, filing down the hall towards the kitchen. I'm heading there. Okay. Everybody, wants heading there. In Everybody wants to get some. Probably seven hours. Max definitely no, wait, to get something to eat. Nine hours. So as you enter the kitchen. Did we get food on the plane? I can right. What's that? Did we get food on the plane? No. Well, you probably got to eat it. It's in a biscuit. Uh, I'm eating everything. <laughs> Not everything. Be great. As you enter the kitchen, you can see this, is this large pot has been set up. Uh, this older gentleman stands behind it. Smooth ladle in and out. It looks to be some sort of rice with like a chicken and gravy and vegetables poured over top of it. Sets up all the plates. Everybody kind of helps themselves to the other, you know, fruits and cheeses and other things that's been kind of laid out. Sitting down, and you guys get your own plates, take a seat. Uh, you see Robin across the way, look over towards you, Gunner. She gives a bit of a wave, grabs her food, and hurries over, taking a seat next to you. Smiles. I know it looks like slop, but it's awfully good stuff. So how are you making out? Catherine didn't grab your balls too hard, did she? Oh, no. No, no, no. I, I, I spoke out of turn, which I completely understand. Oh, yeah. You don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I learned my lesson. But I don't care how this looks. I haven't eaten in about nine hours. It's getting shoved down my gullet. Oh, it's actually pretty damn tasty. Yeah, you know. Oh. <laughs> Let's sit down with them, if it's all right. Yes. Since they're like the only two people I really know, and I'll be like, uh, "This isn't squirrel, is it?" Uh, I'll turn around and say, uh, "Actually, I uh, didn't see any chickens around here. Did see a lot of penguins, though, huh, Gunner?" <laughs> Gunner just glares at you, but he continues to eat because he is very hungry. I look over and say, I think penguins are like squirrel, though. They're all dark meat, so <clears throat> I'm pretty sure this ain't penguin. If Could they're going to pick any penguin, too, they might as well use the more popular penguins. I wouldn't be using endangered species. Well, you know, we don't see the Chikov penguins very around here very often, but, you know, I don't think he, Russell, shot one. And as far as I know, they, I mean, I mean, you know, they do taste like chicken. And she kind of smiles towards you, Gunner. Not that I would know what a Chikov penguin tastes like, of course. But I've heard they taste like chicken. But I'm, pre I'm pretty sure this is chicken. We get it, you know, from the base out on the coast where we picked you up. Uh, stuff is shipped in from the U.S. Uh, we send them out our list every week. We turn, I go out there, fly out there, pick up the stuff like I did today. That was off for the next week's worth of food. And so uh, it, it's probably rehydrated dried chicken and probably not the best, a little gamey, but it, it should be chicken. Should it's be. better than nothing, Robin. It's better than nothing. So, so how the rest of you make out with Catherine? Uh, quite a peach, isn't she? I mean, yeah, she's a little bit of a hard ass, but I mean, got it. You know, some people, when they get stuck down here for months and months and months, I mean, they just, that's how they end up. But, you know, since, yeah, I've. People get a little ornery being down here for a while. I've only been here for seven months myself. Uh, Bennett, 10 years. He's been a 10-year vet of being here at the place. Catherine's been here for nine. When you reach that sort of length, I suppose you do go a little mad to some degree. Bennett's a nice guy, a little loopy, a bit forgetful, but he's a good guy. Yeah, he seemed all right. He's a... And he'll find for the most part. Everybody pretty much does their own thing. Everybody's a little different. Most is over towards the long red-headed girl. Haley's a little flighty, like I said. Runs around a bit. Young girl, naive. She'll learn her way in life. And Jen, she points to the guy that you were talking to, Marshall. Who looks to be working on some sort of puzzle with two other guys around him on the table. Some sort of like weird tetris -y sort of looking thing. It says... Smartest damn guy I've ever met, but doesn't have a lick of common sense in him. Actually, get this. And she kind of huddles you guys in a little bit. <laughs> Every night, he never locks his door, so I sneak in and I move his toothpaste. He goes absolutely dead, ape shit in the morning. He thinks there's a ghost in there. 
Don't say anything. Wait, just wait till tomorrow morning. It's fucking hilarious. I I nudge. Uh, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting the uh, Jesse's character's name. Marshall. Marshall. Nudge Marshall. Marshall. I say that that'd be a good one to catch on video. Catch her doing that shit. That'd be no, cool no, 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 no. Can't catch no. me doing that. No, no. I mean, he won't see it until after. I mean, way later when he finally gets to put it out on TV. But, but damn, that'd be funny. Marshall's just awkwardly quiet because now he's thinking I may have misjudged that situation. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, it's absolutely hilarious, though. I'm thinking of starting to move his hairbrush too because he, he has a bit of that wave thing going with his hair. He's just taking it slow at first. Don't scare him too much. He's a he's a, he's a good. One. Says you know. Says and if you know I have any questions about people around here, or whatever, just ask. Uh, really can't say much more about the others. Uh, everybody's pretty decent. Uh, I'm sure you'll get along with Allie just fine. You and your Chikov penguins and playing with her eggs and how well, he met Russell, and swagger that he is. But you know, guys need anything, want any questions, just hit me up. I you know pretty much get along with everybody. Or at least try to. We'll be in the hockey game later on. Says, ah, oh, yeah. Says, I've got a bit of a uh, revenge match against Gibbs. You know, last time he outscored me a few, but I think I can take him this time. You gonna, you guys gonna play? You guys should come play. I think, uh, I think Bennett and I have a challenge between us. Oh, if, get if, it. It, if it ain't got a football, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So. Cause I all right. None of us really well. Most people suck. I'm pretty damn good. If I say so myself. And Gibbs says Bennett. He's actually a pretty good guy, but old. You know, your best bet is probably take a little bit easy on him, Gunner. You know, he, he tends to get a little upset when people you know are really outscore him and are obviously better than him, unless he knows they are like, like myself or Gibbs. But you know, just, just if you want to get on his good side, he'll be your best friend forever. If you know you give him that edge, but. You know, take that with what you will. So, what about you, cameraman? You, you going to be playing hockey with us? I was two-time All-American lacrosse. Can't be that much different. I'll give it a shot. Well, yep, you just hit a puck across the floor instead of throwing a ball into each other's holes, right? <laughs> I think you'll do all right. Sorry. This is but. Fellas, I gotta go get a bit of work done, and uh, you know, head back to the game. Gunner, we're gonna be having a few board games over in my room tonight. If you wanna join us, uh, Henry and I. But, uh, will checkers be involved? Quite possibly. Yeah, maybe I'll swing around. Yeah. Thank you for the invite. Certainly, you should come over. It's, it's a good time. Henry's a good guy. He, I think you guys will get along fine. He, he's the he's the weatherman of the station. Basically, he's he's the guy who lets us know what's going on and what times to go out, and you know, just basically make sure everything's blowing over okay. Says, but I have busy to do, so you guys finish eating and eight o'clock, Aki. With that, she kind of offers you all a bit of a smile and nod, and takes her tray up, dropping it off at the sink area. You can see that there's a small, uh, younger, older woman, like in her fifties, washing dishes and helping clean up up there along with the guy who was serving the food. And other people begin to, you know, kind of clean up, taking their trays up. You see Jin and two the other two guys working on this puzzle over in the corner still. Every now and then, if you happen to take notice of him, Marshall, he's constantly looking at you out of the corner of his eye and talking. He'll kind of motion his hand in your direction now and then. The others will give a bit of a look in your direction as well. When you happen to notice the kind of flock eyes, you have that awkward moment as you look at each other. He just smiles, and he's like, room three. <laughs> Two, thirteen. <laughs> when when uh, Robin gets up and walks away, I'm going to kind of look over at Gunner for a minute and just tell him, say, uh, you know, if I didn't know any better, I'm, I'd say that woman's trying to get your britches off, son. That's a guy. <laughs> Huh? Yeah, Jin's a guy. 
Oh, you're yeah. talking to Gunner. Oh, oh Gunner. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I, I was just saying, we're very confused about Rob. No, no, no. no I didn't. You, you kind of went into us. I don't want to interrupt you, but I, I said when Robin gets up from the table and walks away, I'm going to look over at Gunner and say, I think that woman wants a little sweet on you and trying to get you, might be trying to get your britches off, boy. Well, if she manages it, then it'll be incredibly cold. I'll have to keep her warm. <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> he smiles widely. <laughs> Uh, is Haley kicking about? Uh, you look around. You can see, you know, just as she's dropping her trays off and, like, bustling out the door in a hurry, trying to get all of her hair that's, like, flying all over the place kind of into a bun on her head. Okay. I was going to ask her if she's going to be able to give me my passcode, but I imagine that's probably where she's off to go. So I'll probably head in after her. Uh, after I ask the old lady, do you need a help hand with the washing up? You see, she turns around. She's kind of like stomach level to you. She's probably like barely five feet. And kind of looks up. Oh, no, dearie. It's perfectly fine. I like dishes. It's, it's good for these old hands to get in the warm water. Arthritis and all the warm water helps soothe the pain. It says, thank you for helping, lad. I, I appreciate that. No problem at all. My name's Gunner. And he, he does extend a hand. He sort of extends a hand, but he knows he probably, she probably can't shake it. She extends a hand, extends a hand anyway. Yeah, she sort of looks at and looks at her hands. They're all soapy and hot. And she says, well, kind of smacks her hand into yours, soap and water, dripping over. She says, Matilda, Matilda Evans. I'm just a press cook around here. Don't really do too much, but my granddaughter, she, she likes to spend her money in vacation here. I'm sure you'll meet her soon enough. It's a pleasure to meet you, Matilda. And then I head off to go get my passcode. She smiles. See, she actually seemed quite happy that you talked to her a little, you know, comforting, I guess. And she smiles and goes back to her work. Well, as soon as you step out, you can see Haley, like, sitting into her, you know, walking into, like, an office there. And she looks up. She's waving you forward. What are the other two doing? Are you guys sticking around? or? Sorry. How how close is it to hockey time? It looks like you got about an hour or so. Um. Hmm. I'll probably go find um. I don't know. Probably go find Haley and and go ahead and see if I can get my stuff put in to the computer and get that knocked out before hockey time. Great minds think alike. And Marshall, the other two you see leave. It's basically just you at the table finishing up and I'm gonna, Jen and his buddies across the way. I'll probably sit there for a few minutes just looking around watching people because, you know, at this stage I've forgotten about the passcode um, until I catch another awkward glance with Jen then I'll – towards uh, IT. So as you Is step that Jim out, or Jin? For Jin. J I N. J I N. Haley. Lovely. Jubbly. You know, Haley comes, waves you in. She smiles and sees Mac and sees Marshall. You guys, you see, she quickly waves all you over. Says, All right, I think I got you guys all set up into the systems. I'm going to give you your passcodes. I got some laminated pictures here. Just little stuff, passcodes. Got to clip them onto your collar. Make sure you wear them at all times. You know, just in case we find a dead body, we know how to investigate and find out who it is and maybe what happened. Because that happened to Tom. You know, there wasn't really much left of him, but we did find his his name badge. And, you know, it was a little bit bloodied up. I had to clean it off a little bit. We were able to identify him and we got him into the system. Uh, Unfortunately, he's dead now. Oh, what? Well, can I help? Calm down. <laughs> Not so fast. This is Haley, right? Yes. Damn, girl, take a breath. You don't, oh, we don't have time for that. We don't have time for that right now. Talking like that. That's right. That's right. It's people always say I talk fast, but it's, <laughs> it's okay, Haley. I got you. Okay, so no. this is what you're going to need to do. I'm going to give you a passcode. It's four numbers, okay? Followed by a letter. Mac, what's your pin code going to be? Uh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just playing, Haley. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> How many digits? How many? How many does it need to be? Four digits. Four digits. 
Let's go with uh, 1667. 1667. Mac, Gunner, you take note of that. His pin number is 1667. If you want to get in anything or do anything under his name, that's what you got to do. Oh, so it's going to be like that. Okay, all right. Yes. So I'll write down a different number and hand it to her. So the first rule actually is actually rule number 434. It's in your booklet, if you look, is to not give your passcode out to anybody. So if somebody asks for your passcode, you cannot give them your passcode. I was just <laughs> testing you there, and it seems like you failed. Make sure that if Catherine asks you your passcode, you do not tell her because she will ask you your passcode. And she may have asked a little intimidating. and she tends to drill the thing a little bit and, you know, make sure she tries to get it out of you. But if you do not give it out of her, then she, she might like you a little bit and wouldn't be so hard-pressed to uh, be rude to you. She, she, she was mean to me a few times, but anyway, so if somebody asks for your passcode, do not give me a passcode. That's rule number 427. It's in your booklet. Make sure you know it. So all of you, she slides over a couple pieces of paper, write down your passcode. She said, unfortunately, I'm going to have to put it into the system. I might know it, but I promise I don't, you know, I don't store anything up here in my brain. Well, I do. I'm actually quite intelligent, but I won't remember your passcode if you put it in. I'll put it in. I promise not to do otherwise, and you'll be all right. So as long as you trust me. Because, you know, I'm human resources. I got to take care of this stuff. I'm going to have to need this information. Just like I knew that was Tom that got smushed under the bucket loader because I seen his PIN number. And I didn't remember his PIN number, but I seen his profile picture. And I was like, hey, that's Tom. He got smushed under a bucket loader. So I was able to put him into the system. He's deceased now, so we don't have his PIN number anymore. It's all been reset. So write your PIN numbers down. Put it in with a four digits, one letter. It'll be put into the system. Within an hour, you'll be up to go. You can use your PIN number to get into your room in case you lose your key. There's a passcode on the button. You just push in your buttons, and the door will open up. That'll work for most of the other station rooms as well. Some of them are still locked off because they're only available to Catherine and for Bennett and some of the other maintenance people. Mac, you'll probably have a skeleton key for some of the rooms. Uh, they do not open the bedrooms, so you can't go sneaking around in bedrooms. I've seen that look. Don't be doing it. But it will open all the maintenance closets and, you know, the garages and such things otherwise. And let's see. It will help you get into the computer system in case you need to send emails. I'm looking at you, Marshall. Hi, Jin told me all about what you needed. You do not be asking the people, other people to use into their systems to send emails for other people. That's very rude. And actually, that is in the booklet, too. So if Catherine asks you to send an email, or you ask Catherine to send an email, that will not go over very well. You have to use your own PIN code to get into the system and send an email. But you should be able to do that within an hour so you can tell your assistant, Valerie, that she did not read the fine print correctly and that you have an issue with that. Any questions? No. Is this where I put it in at right here? Is this where I you, type it in at? You got it. Okay. So I'm going to lean over and type in my pen, and I'm going to be like this. <sighs> Chip, where's the backspace key? Okay, here we go. All right, there we go. I got it. Yes, clearly. <laughs> She quickly types over and just a spread of numbers, her fingers flying over the keyboard. You can see this little thing prints out. She says, stand right here. We need to get a picture. Uh, you cannot use your GoPro for this picture camera, so I'm going to need actually for you to stand in front of the picture because I got my own GoPro camera that's going to be taking pictures. So uh, Mac, if you will, please stand in front of this picture. Yep, just like that. Smile. She pushes a button. You can see this horrible picture. It has like only half your face on it because she did wait for you to get in line with it. Prints out. She slaps a piece of laminate over and hands it to you. Who's next? Gunner, Gunner, you look like you stepped. Stand right up here, Gunner. I'll take a picture of you. Put in your passcode. Go ahead and take that in. Gunner mm -hmm. types in his, his password as fast as possible and then gets into frame as fast as possible. <laughs> Give me a dexterity <laughs> check. Mac starts oh, laughing. Crap. Oh, crap. <laughs> okay, I, I rolled a 10, so that's an 8. Oh, nice. my God. So, yeah, you get your picture in, but it's kind of like that, you know, just barely getting in there. You just shoot your head over, so it's kind of all awkward and skewed a little bit. <laughs> Handsome. You know, everybody will like that one. She prints that out, and then she hands it over. Pin code, passcode, don't lose it. Make sure you clip it to your collar every morning. And, Marshall, you are next. Stay in front of the camera. Put in your passcode number. So, of course, I will try to do my best to a headshot type smile and all from the picture. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, type in my passcode and everything like that. But Make sure she gets my good side. Yep, she wish we to get So, what side is the good side? What side should you take a picture of? You want a left hand shot, a oh. right shot, a head shot? You oh, tell me when you're ready, right. cameraman, and I'll, I'll push the button to take a picture when you're ready. All right. One, three. One, two. <laughs> so, she hits it just <laughs> as you're starting to pose. Very handsome. Uh, I'll be sure to send this out. I. Well, you'll see. You'll see. see let's laminate that. Hands that over to you. Passcode everything. You can send out your email to Valerie. Let her know you need more volume. 
<laughs> and everything should be good. You guys are all set. Any questions? No. Thank you very much. I appreciate all your help. You will you be joining well. us for hockey? Oh, no, 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 no. I have more important things to do than hockey. I like to watch sometimes. I might come down to watch. I, I'm not playing. You can come down and you just, I got, you can come down and watch. I'm not going to play. I don't know how to play hockey. What the hell is hockey? Uh, they don't, I don't know how to play hockey either. Really, I don't know how to play hockey either. I just go to watch Gibbs because you know, it's quite the stuff. Nothing. I'm hoping that one of these days maybe I can get you know, a little bit of this thing. But, uh, but I don't want to get into the Who's this uh, you're uh, interested in, Haley? What's that? Who's this you're interested in? Am I interested? I didn't no. hear the name. Oh, Gibbs. Oh, Gibbs. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, the Army, the military guy. Yeah, he's... I don't think he really likes me, though. Uh, he's a begging. I find that very difficult to believe, Haley. <laughs> she kind of eyes widen a little bit when you say that, Mac, and she well, she says, yes, well, I have work to do, so uh, if you guys will let me be on my way, uh, maybe I will see you later, and I'll come down to watch a bit of hockey. If you have any issues, you if you have any words, if pass codes do not work, if you need a better picture taken, I'll be happy to do so on another day. <laughs> and if you need anything for human resources, all the insurance paperwork should be done, the fine print signed. Uh, if I need anything signed, I will let you know, and you are good to go. All righty. Do she we like, tell you our passcode, Morgan? Or are we good just not us knowing? Nope. It? Nope. Just you guys. And with that, you know, nice. she hurries up around the desk, grabs the door, and opens it up for you, and just kind of smiles at each one of you as you head on out. Quickly goes up behind you. If you look behind you, you can see she like literally runs back behind her desk and gets back to work, putting earbuds into where her head's bobbing to some sort of music. I think you might hear Justin Bieber echoing out of her room, but not quite sure. Boy. <laughs> and with that, you can hear this uh, alarm kind of going off 15 minutes until hockey. Sign-ups are on the door. Anybody interested should stop on down. Gunner will stop on down. All right, so Gunner's going to play. And Mac, you're just watching. That was Marshall. Marshall. And Mac, are you just watching or are you playing? Oh, no, I'm just going to watch. I don't, I don't know nothing about no hockey. <laughs> All right. So as you guys get down there, you can see there looks to be a team of five on either side, five people. Uh, there's still one place left on either team. So, Gunner, you're going to be on Bennett's team. And Marshall, you're going to be on Gibbs' team. Or, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. Gunner, you're on Gibbs. And Marshall, you're on Bennett's. Who else is on my team? Oh, you're going to have to ask. Let me look. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so you're going to have Gunner, Gibbs, Kevin, Robin, and Allie. Oh, yes. And then Marshall, team. Bennett, John, Jen, <laughs> and Ash. Nope. Yeah, Ashley. Gunner. So there's, a, there's an Gunner. Ashley. This worked out really well. Gunner, you want to trade? I flipped him off. <laughs> with, a smile, with a smile on my face. So he knows I'm joking. <laughs> I, I love that it's constantly with a smile on my face so he knows I'm joking. Let's <laughs> make sure. I was, I was a bit of a dickhead earlier, so I need to make sure that people don't get the impression that I'm an asshole. Yes. Gunnar quickly writes his name down under Robin and Allie and Kevin and Gibbs, leaving you, Marshall. You can see John has already written his name down just above yours. Or Jen, I'm sorry. As you guys entered this gym, you can see hockey things are kind of set up on either side. They got the nets all set up. Robin quickly tosses you a stick. Gunner tosses you another one, Marshall. Says, so, are you ladies ready? I was born ready. All right. I try, so, I try and spin the stick in my hand, but I'm, I probably drop it. So the only one rule, and that there is no rules. No holds barred. Cross-checking is perfectly legal. I suggest you wear a helmet or a mouth guard. And maybe a few pads. She just gives you a bit of a smile. You don't notice that there are any gear or anything around besides the hockey stick blades and hockey puck. And as you guys set up, we will leave it there for the night and pick up the hockey game next session. Uh, okay. Oh, man, it's been built up all day. <laughs> what a cliffhanger. <laughs> what a cliffhanger. Yes. Awesome. All right.
So let me save those. So. Oh, Valerie is so getting fired. 